surprises, Thomas, of DST. DST is one of those investment groups. Which one do you prefer? Are you a left wing or right wing? The right hand side. Okay. They're one of these, one of these things sometimes popping up in our <laughs> lives where we didn't see that coming. And I guess Yuri Milner, who is, I guess, your boss, the person you work with, um, surprised us all when he came out of Russia, invested in big names in, in America, and made good returns. Tell us a little bit of a history of DST, how it all started, before we talk about the present. So, um, the origins of DST are uh, pretty new. So, unlike many investment firms, we're actually only six years old. Um, and there's really two parts to the firm. One part is uh, from an operating background, and that's Yuri, who built an internet company in Russia called Mail.ru, which is a large, uh, large company, a large uh, uh, internet group. They're public now, I believe. Went public in 2010. Uh, you know you roughly the market cap today? Moves a lot with it, the oil we price, don't, we don't unlike... Give uh, it us in rubles. <laughs> no, I, uh, I actually haven't checked it since... The oil uh, since price? Because no. the ruble moves with the oil price. Ah, okay. Therefore, the, uh, every, every share price in, in Russia moves with the oil price. Um, but it's a multi-billion dollar business. Yeah, right? at, uh, at its peak, it was about an $8 billion company. So he was an entrepreneur. Right. And then uh, myself and uh, one of my other partners were at uh, Goldman, and we were either in an advisory side of my partner or myself, I was on the investment side, and had tried to invest in Mail.ru a few times and hence built a relationship. So they're the two sides of the firm that came together starting in 2009. And today we're five partners globally um, uh, with a truly global focus and trying to find great founders, great companies to invest in at what we call a growth stage or, or you can call it late stage investing. Um, roughly speaking, about 40% of our capital into Asia, 40% into the Americas, and 20% into Europe. Um, and we've had uh, some, some decent success uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and luck, really, in backing great founders. Um, so give us, give us some examples of the kind of last deals you have done, like over the last five years back, um, to the extent they're public. Because some of the stuff is a bit under the radar. Right. So I guess we, we started, our very first investment was uh, in 2009 in Facebook. Um, yeah. Since then, we've invested in companies like Twitter. Are you out or are you still in Facebook? Uh, we don't comment on positions, okay. uh, particularly in public companies. Um, so we've invested in things like Twitter, Airbnb, uh, Lending Club, House, Snapchat, um, in, uh, in China, in companies like Alibaba Group and JD.com, Xiaomi, DD Taxi, in India, in Flipkart and Ola Cabs, in uh, Europe. Uh, you can build a whole zoo of unicorns here. That's the thesis. Um, and, and I'm a little bit disappointed as a European who wants to focus on the European ecosystem. You're sitting in London. I guess you are British originally? Or Irish. Irish. Okay. Sorry. Irish. Um, why don't we start talking about Europe? Why do you start first? Is it historically? Because I wanted to finish with the, with the greatest ones. Oh, I love it. Uh, okay, go for so, it. So in Europe, we, uh, our first investments were really in 2011. We invested in Spotify and Klarna in 2011. Um, Scandinavian focus. Since then, we've, we've continued on. We have a number of investments which are not yet public. The ones which we have announced in Europe include uh, Funding Circle, Farfetch, both here in London, and Auto One Group in Berlin. And you are also in Zalando, I believe. And Zalando as well. Zalando. Yeah. So, you guys pick winners. You are winners because I know that the way you do deals, you cut out all the crap, which is kind of our approach to investment banking. We want to make it without ego keeping a lot of fun and going straight to the point. And if you measure the quality of a VC, not just by the value they add, but also of how fast they're getting deals done, I think your group is famous of doing relatively light term sheets and closing deals fast. How fast do you close deals? That, that's, a, that's a pretty tricky question because it kind of depends on the scenario and the situation. You know, we can, we can do things, I think, much faster than most people because we're a small but you're partnership. you're fast deciders, right? Pardon? You're very fast deciders. Yeah. I think, look, the, the idea behind the way we structure ourselves is we want to be small and nimble. Um, we want to be very specialized. We only invest in the internet. So we're not uh, held at IC by, you know, looking at software companies and looking at banks and looking at, uh, you know, industrial companies, et cetera. All we look at at investment committee are internet companies. It's like Noah. 
So uh, it gives us uh, uh, great flexibility, gives us great speed, and I think is also part of the value add because all we do day in day out is internet. Okay, you guys have a big name. I think you're one of the biggest investors, uh, not only in Europe but globally, which is very rare to see someone who has invested on all continents. What is it you are looking for? What kind of deals appeal to you? And from all the great entrepreneurs in this room and wherever they network throughout the building currently, um, what criteria DST is most interested in? So I'd caveat th what I'm going to say by we are looking for innovation, and therefore it is not definable. Uh, we are looking for business models that we don't understand when we first meet them. We're looking for industries that we hadn't spotted that are ripe for disruption. We're looking for uh, founders that uh, break the mold and aren't normal. Uh, and therefore, it's not quite definable up front. But as a general framework of what we're looking for, we, by default, as a growth equity investor or a late-stage investor, we're not looking to place many bets in a sector. We will make generally one investment in a category. It's the op so opposite approach of Lee Fixer from Tiger, who, who likes to hedge his bets by going into various different players in the same market and see who is going to win the rat race. I think if we can have the success of Tiger, I'd be very happy. Yeah, that so approach worked as well. It absolutely works. Um, but uh, we have a slightly different approach, uh, which is uh, very much to learn, analyze, understand the category, understand the companies, and to back one company in each category. So by definition, we're looking for category leaders. The second thing we're looking for is, is founding management teams. We are minority investors by definition. We're looking to be very much uh, synced with the founders, synced with the management team. Uh, we want to be aligned in incentives, and we think uh, great internet and technology companies are built by the original team, uh, not by professional teams. So what makes a great entrepreneur versus a not so great entrepreneur? I think certainly vision and insight as to what they are trying to disrupt, what they're trying to build. Uh, but I think passion, more than anything, sets people apart. The fact is, uh, like any great endeavor, building a great company takes a lot of effort, a lot of man hours. But beyond that, also takes a lot of uh, 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 desire and ability to incentivize the teams around you. Great engineering teams, for example, can go to any company. They can go sit at Google and get a nice yeah. free lunch and have great option packages. They can go and work at a startup of a five-person team and have a shot, moonshot approach. But either way, they want to be excited. They want to be incentivized by the founder. And I don't mean economically incentivized. I mean in their imagination and in their inspiration. And I think great founding teams have that ability to excite those around them as to what their vision and passion is. And what we see a lot of increasingly in Europe are founders that have multi-year visions and multi-billion dollar visions. And that's very different. I think five years ago, there was a lack of, of founders in Europe that had the, the desire to be independent companies 10 years down the line, and a desire to be $10 billion companies. Increasingly, we're seeing that coming Does through. that mean that you're mostly interested in large markets or also in markets which actually get great through digital? We're happy to, to be believers in the creation of new markets. Generally, uh, I'm a believer in a zero-sum game globally. So if you're extracting money from a new market, it's probably coming from somewhere. So it's rare that there's an absolutely new, you know, just brand new created market. So, so one can talk about Uber and Didi Taxi and Ola Cabs sort of creating part of a market for themselves, but somebody's losing somewhere. Are you investor in Uber? In which? Are you investor in Uber? No, we're investor in Didi Taxi and in Ola Cabs. The Ubers of the emerging markets, basically. I wouldn't call them the Ubers or anything. They're, they're, they're their own companies. They're their own companies. Just helps us to understand because we don't so often take taxis in which countries are they operating in? Uh, China and India, respectively. Yeah, I haven't taken a taxi there recently. Um, so let's talk about money. What is the usual check size you look at when you're investing? We try to be pretty flexible. Um, we What's the smallest, biggest? We would aim to be 25 and above. Uh -huh. um, we can go through many hundreds of millions, um, and we're relatively flexible in between. And considering the Russian roots of DST, now you're everywhere, and I think your headquarter is in Hong Kong, is that Correct. right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> do you help companies also to scale globally into other markets? Yeah, I think our, our, probably our best, uh, if we have a value add, and only our portfolio companies can tell if this is true or not, our, our best value add, I think, is really from that global focus. So it's both introductions and partnerships, but it's also uh, idea sharing 
and visibility into what's going on elsewhere in the world. So business models can innovate and evolve differently in different markets, and we can help bridge the gaps between founders to understanding how those business models are changing. So you're a smart coach in the corner. I wouldn't call myself a coach. I would call myself the, uh, the player didn't quite even make the subs bench. But uh, <laughs> you know, we certainly trying to share information globally and, and insights globally. And I think that's what we bring to the table. We're not operators. We don't come and join the board and say, we can help you hire your next five guys. We can help you, you know, work out how to scale engineering. That's not our, that's not our role. It's not our value add. Uh, we think we're much more in support, advice, input, and, and, and partnerships. What's your view on valuations? We talked a lot at this conference about overvaluation, undervaluation. Some people have different views depending on what side they are. Uh, do we have an overvaluation problem that started in the US? Well, I think, I think the best way you just described it is that uh, people have all sorts of views. And uh, we would have a very boring life if people didn't have different views. And, and, and valuations you know, is no different to having different views on a football match. Um, and I think in particular, it's difficult to have very strong views when we're talking about private companies, which by definition nobody has information on. There's always a the lack insiders. of information. You see numbers popping up, it's oh wow, right? And then you don't know other liquidation right, and preferences. You know, the nice thing between GMV and revenue, right? And everybody calls it revenue. Is it really Small revenue detail. or GMV? Small detail. So so I think I think the first thing is to caveat is to say, look, this is it's a very opaque concept as to what, what company is being valued for. But but I certainly think there are pockets of exuberance. Uh, we're definitely seeing more um, followers than we are leaders in the investment community, I think, in the last few years, which by default means certain sectors, certain categories get very hot, people pile in and that drives valuations up. But I think perhaps there, beyond the structuring point you made, or the comments you made, like liquidation preference, ratchets, et cetera, which, is, which has been blogged about incessantly over the last six months, I think one really important point that's not talked about it sufficiently is different investors have different return expectations and, and, and requirements. What's your return expectation? Ignoring mine for a second. <laughs> because uh, that's easy for me to ignore. If you think about a multi-asset firm, a firm that can either invest in bonds or uh, public equities or inflation derivatives, and in their current environment, they might be thinking, look, I used to make 12% on, on the high yield market, I can now make 6%, or used to make 9% on equities, I'm now making 4%. When they look at a private company, maybe six months out from an IPO, 12 months out from an IPO, if they can have a pretty low risk 15% IRR, that could be very exciting for them because their alternative is 5% or maybe zero in government bonds. When you're thinking about it from a venture capital point of view or a growth equity point of view where our IRR expectations haven't necessarily changed hugely, you can't compare the two in terms of setting valuation because valuation is just a derivative of what you think the future value is discounted back. And if one person's discount rate is 30% and one is 15%, you're going to end up at a very vastly different number. And I think that's, that's not spoken about enough. Klaus Hommels, who presented yesterday morning his view on the sector, he was once asked when he did a deal at a healthy valuation, don't you think you overpaid for that? And his answer was, I would have paid 30% more for this and still have done the deal. And on a bad deal, I wouldn't have done it for 30% less. So I guess this goes a little bit in the direction of your philosophy. You look at the fundamental opportunity. Where can this go to? And does the entrepreneur has the vision and the passion to get there? And you look at the big picture and don't get blurred by kind of short-term valuation aspects? I, I'm not sure I'd go that far, because I think uh, as any investor, and with, you know, we have uh, fiduciary duties to our limited partners, you have to uh, justify the valuation on every company you invest in. So I, don't, uh, I, I think we tried to take a bigger picture and ha have a kind of a more macro view, perhaps. But ultimately, you have to have a case that you believe in five years out, uh, 10 years out, whatever it is, and believe what the valuation will be at that point. And you know, we continuously track company performance versus our expectations and versus management expectations. But our biggest sense, source of pride is uh, in, uh, in accurately forecasting where a company goes, both in terms of product, in terms of management capability and expansion, and in terms of financial performance. So I think we become very, you have to, if you're going to invest uh, 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 millions of dollars of, of, of people's money into companies, you have to have a very concrete view very well established, very well thought through. It doesn't need to take you months. You can do it very quickly, uh, but you do need to have a very concrete view on that company, on the specifics, on the financials. So and to us, the biggest thing is, is always looking at market size, management potential, uh, incumbents or, or, or comp competitive environment, and unit economics. And I think probably the biggest thing that's occurred in the last one year of too much money perhaps in our ecosystem 
is a failure to focus on unit economics by, by many investment companies. So you had a lot of success as a firm, and you personally in Europe, I think you called some great names. Was it like an investment you guys regret? There are many investments that we've missed and that we wish we had it done. Uh, there are many uh, investments that we hope to do in the future that we have perhaps missed in the past. I don't think we regret doing any of the investments we have done. I think we, we feel good that we made all of our investments for the right reasons. Uh, and uh, whether they work out incredibly well or only so well, we still feel we chose them for the right reasons. And this goes back to having a very concrete view uh, as to why you're making the investment, and of course learning from when it doesn't work out the way you thought it was. DST, strong on stage and strong in the ecosystem. Thank you so much yeah. for being with us. I know you guys are usually quite publicity shy, but it's very Anything interesting. Anything for you. It's very interesting Thank you. to learn some of, some of your way you think about this industry. And Thank you. And investing. Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen.